Welcome back. Tom Harvin here with you. On the line with us, Charles Sauer, the libertarian economist and president of the Market Institute, the author of the new book, Profit Motive, What Drives the Things We Do, just uh, out yesterday. Marketinstitute.org is the website. You can tweet Charles at Charles Sauer, S-A-U-E-R is how he spells his last name. Charles Sauer is his Twitter handle. Charles, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me on, Tom. My pleasure. So we've been talking about Facebook and this, this new business model of spy and sell, basically. And it's not just Facebook that engages in this. Credit card companies are spying on us and selling our information. Uh, supermarkets, if you uh, plug in your discount card number, they're keeping track of everything you buy and they're selling that information. Uh, the pharmacies now, if, particularly if they're affiliated with supermarkets or if they have these kinds of cards, they're keeping track of what you do. They might even be selling your information to health insurance companies for all we know so, you, so they can figure out, how, hey, you know, this guy's drinking too much wine or taking the wrong pills or whatever. Um, but, but you know, it, it, Facebook is the, the most in our face. I mean, Facebook's pursuit of, of obscene profits that have made uh, Mark Zuckerman, uh, you know, one of the morbidly rich among us, uh, this pursuit of obscene profit has now led us to, apparently, to have, you know, Republicans controlling the House and the Senate and Donald Trump in the White House. Uh, what is the libertarian response to the corruption of this business model by Facebook and others? Well, first off, it's not to define what is an obscene profit, right? Like the, the, the left is fully in charge of figuring out what is a right profit and moral profit and what is not a moral profit. But the fact is, is that the free market is what is going to solve this current Facebook leak problem. And we, we've been confronted with this in the past and the free market hasn't done it. And that's because the, the money in providing these websites is actually in the data. I mean, Facebook's free. The users of Facebook are not the clients of Facebook. The clients of Facebook are the advertisers. The users of Facebook, me uh, specifically, uh, you know, we are the product that Facebook is selling. And I think that that's perfectly fine. I get a lot out of Facebook. It's, you know, I've been connected with people that I haven't been connected with in years. I'm getting ready to set up my, uh, my a high, another high school reunion. And that's all being done over Facebook. Facebook's providing me a value. They just happen to be selling my time on their website to other people. Yeah, and so, uh, first of all, just for the record, I offend, I, I'm offended by the use of the phrase free market because you and I both know that there's no such thing as a free market. There is a regulated marketplace. The government provides the currency. The government provides the, the rules of the road. The government provides the court system to regulate it. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a fantasy. But, but that said, I think that there is some truth to what you're saying. You know, the, the arguable, uh, the, the, the libertarian argument that I would make if you and I were on, uh, had reversed roles, um, would be that, you know, this is the perfect opportunity to the guys who, who ran MySpace or to, you know, a bunch of disgruntled Facebook people to go out and start their own company and say to people, if you don't want to be tracked, if you don't want to be spied on, if you don't want yourself to be sold in exchange for a free product, we will give you product for 2 or $3 a month, which is probably about how much Facebook is monetizing you and me. We will give you a product for 2 or $3 a month where you're never tracked, you're never spied on, and your information is absolutely confidential. Um, that seems like, you know, that should be the libertarian response. And my response to that would be, but <laughs> Facebook essentially has created a monopoly. They have 60% of, of everybody in the United States right now is on Facebook. So they have reached the point, much like Standard Oil had before, before Teddy Roosevelt broke them up, they've reached the point where it's impossible for a competitor to gain a toehold. What do you do well, look, when, when, that, well, when that level of, of monopoly has been reached? Well, thank you for answering the question for me. I'm sorry that I had to set uh, part of the setup straight first. But the fact is, is people have tried to compete. Ello, uh, for instance, which I signed up for. I don't know if you have, but if you haven't, it really harms your right to complain about something like this. But I signed up for Ello a few years ago, and it was a non-data tracking um, website. But the fact is, is that the demand hasn't been there. The demand is there for people to give up their information. People are more willing to give up their information than for free. So it doesn't mean that we need a, a leftist policy to come in, or for that matter, a populist policy to come in and set the market straight. It's competitors that are going to do it, and the demand's not there. Maybe the, maybe the demand is up for uh, Cambridge Analytica. 
um, after the Cambridge Analytica debacle for something to come in. But I still don't think it's going to happen. I mean, the fact is, is that, you know, Facebook has a lot of users. Facebook is going to continue having users. Here's the thing that might actually do it instead of users setting it free, and that is Wall Street changing its mind. We've seen a major downtick in Facebook stock in the past couple of days. Maybe that's what other companies needed to see that the time was right for investment. But when Facebook gets hit at the pocketbook, that's going to hurt way more than a government regulation that both sides are going to water down by the end. When business was... Uh, proclaiming a free market that they should not be regulated by the government and that their externalities, the, the secondary effects of their business activities um, should not be the business of government. Um, they did this with slavery. They did this with child labor. They did this with pollution, with smokestack uh, stuff. They did this with uh, industrial machinery that would cut your fingers off. Uh, you know, and, and, and ultimately, the people protested and government came in and said, okay, we're going to create a regulation that if you've got, for example, a giant machine that has a, a chopping thing on it, it takes, you know, buttons on, that are at least three feet apart to push those buttons to make that machine work so that fingers don't get chopped off anymore. I, I know that example because that, that was a regulation that went into effect when my dad was working in a tool and die shop back in the 50s or 60s. And, you know, I remember it well because they had to re replace a bunch of machinery. Um, no, you know that example well, Tom, because you just made it up. The fact is, if we go back to uh, most of the research that's done on this, uh, the, there's a 1960s book that I'm sure you're familiar with, but it's The Triumph of Conservatism. I'm familiar with it because of the profit motive involved with it in my book uh, that I just wrote. But the fact is, is that you know, business created most of these regulations you're talking about. And in fact, it's not just that, it's the big businesses that created them. Uh, one of your one of your favorite businessmen, John D. Rockefeller, in fact, was one of the one of the large creators of regulation in business markets. And why did he do that? Because he controlled the formation of those regulations. That's the real story. No, I understand and that's the that. And, I'm, and, and, you know, and, and no, I didn't make up the thing about the the, the, the cutters. But but the, the, the you're you're right to a point. And in fact, I've used that example on this program. Monsanto did the same thing when they invented GMOs during the Reagan and Bush administrations. And they, and they went to Vice President Bush and said, there are no regulations for these things. Therefore, they're not really legal. We want you to regulate them, which legalizes them. And we want you to regulate them in a way that smaller companies can't deal with that level of regulation. And you, know, you could argue that that's a wise thing, actually, because GMOs could be so destructive. Uh, you know, the, the example of the bacteria that was developed here in Oregon, in fact, back around that time when they were still debating regulation, that literally could have killed all plant life on Earth if it had gotten into the wild. Uh, Klebsiella planicola was the name of the bacteria, um, or bacterium, and and but but my point was, you know, we we said no, you can't do child labor anymore. It is destructive to us as a society. You can't pour poisons into the air anymore. It's destructive to us as a society. Are we to the point where it's appropriate to say you can't do spy and sell anymore as a principal business model? It's destructive to society. It brought us Donald Trump, and he could bring us World War III. No, again, it, if you did a regulation like that, I mean, look, we all have our own small businesses, right? You have a, you have a business. Yours isn't uh, necessarily small. Mine's small. My website is going to be hard to close down. All that a regulation like that's going to do is stop the next Facebook. What we need to do is figure out how to allow more competition, how to allow the small guys to come up and maybe start your $3 a month membership service um, to, to keep the data secure. So how do you secure. do that absent of, of uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act? Look, Tom, entrepreneur after entrepreneur, generation after generation has done it. It's only the left that believes that it can't be done. This is something that entrepreneurs can solve. We don't need regulation to stop the entrepreneurs. But what from doing entrepreneurs that. have brought us, Charles, over and over and over again, is death and destruction. I mean, it was. It was look at the the car companies who fought against airbags and seatbelts. You know, thousands of people died during the time that they were lobbying to prevent these these regulations that simply would protect people. You've got you've got Scott Pruitt right now taking apart regulations at EPA that are going to lead to more cancer deaths. You've got you know you've. I mean, it just goes on and on. I I don't. 
I, I, I don't understand how you can argue against any regulation whatsoever. How can you have a football game without the rules, without the NFL saying, here's the rules? How can you have I'm business arguing without... Against Without a basic I'm arguing rules. against regulation as the solution. I'm arguing against the fact that you just demonized entrepreneurs. I'm arguing against the fact that the left wants to hold down I'm demonizing innovation. greed, not entrepreneurs. What I'm saying is that un, unregulated greed, which is expressed by often by entrepreneurs, and, and you and I have both been entrepreneurs most of our lives. I have been my entire life, by and large. Um, you know, I get that. And I get, you know, you know, hey, you know, we, let's make some money and all that kind of thing. But it, see, it, it, it just seems to me that without some practical limits, it becomes like cancer. Cancer is a cell that wants to, it's like a greedy cell, right? It wants to grow and grow and grow and grow and never, never stop. It, 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 the way, you know, looking at the business landscape in America, it looks to me like Facebook has become cancer. Look, I know, I'm going to know the day that you finish reading my book because those arguments are going to stop. That, that line of reasoning doesn't fit with what a good entrepreneur does. You are referring to bad entrepreneurs, but the, the fact is, is that they're not normally the successful entrepreneurs. They're not the successful businessmen. Business involves have you used Will, building Windows something. It involves recently? long term processes. Have, have you used Windows 10 recently? Have you tried? I mean, it's like, oh, geez. Charles, you're saying that, that companies that succeed succeed not because they're, they're, they're willing to destroy the competition and screw the customer, but rather because they're noble? No, I'm saying that businesses are going to stay in business, then they're going to make non-greedy decisions or decisions that don't appear greedy to benefit their bottom line. Businesses aren't aren't in the business of harming customers. Businesses are not in the business, no, they're in the business of pushing of making money, away their they next generation of customers. customers. At the same time, they don't care. I, that businesses always care about keeping no, their they, customers they, and adding well, customers. Sure, That's the sure. bottom and, line. And That's the, the asbestos industry and the tobacco industry tried to bury that research, and now the oil industry, as long as they possibly could, to keep people from knowing the damage that they were doing. That's not the way business works. It's not the way it's ever going to work. Entrepreneurs are going to bring society back. Okay, Charles Sauer, his new book, Profit Motive, just came out. What drives the things we do, marketinstitute.org. Thanks, Charles.